Chapter Eighteen of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Eighteen. Merry days were these at Thornfield Hall, and busy days too. How different from the first three months of stillness, monotony, and solitude I had passed beneath its roof! All sad feelings seemed now driven from the house, all gloomy associations forgotten. There was life everywhere, movement all day long. You could not now traverse the gallery, once so hushed, nor enter the front chambers, once so tenantless, without encountering a smart lady's maid or a dandy valet. The kitchen, the butler's pantry, the servants' hall, the entrance hall were equally alive, and the saloons were only left void and still when the blue sky and halcyon sunshine of the genial spring weather called their occupants out into the grounds. Even when that weather was broken, and continuous rain set in for some days, no damp seemed cast over enjoyment. Indoor amusements only became more lively and varied, in consequence of the stop put to outdoor gaiety. I wondered what they were going to do the first evening a change of entertainment was proposed. They spoke of playing charades, but in my ignorance I did not understand the term. The servants were called in, the dining-room tables wheeled away, the lights otherwise disposed, the chairs placed in a semicircle opposite the arch. While Mr. Rochester and the other gentlemen directed these alterations, the ladies were running up and down stairs, ringing for their maids. Mrs. Fairfax was summoned to give information respecting the resources of the house in shawls, dresses, draperies of any kind, and certain wardrobes of the third story were ransacked, and their contents, in the shape of brocaded and hooped petticoats, satin sacks, black modes, lace lappets, etc., were brought down in armfuls by the Abigails. Then a selection was made, and such things as were chosen were carried to the boudoir within the drawing-room. Meantime Mr. Rochester had again summoned the ladies round him, and was selecting certain of their number to be of his party. "'Miss Ingram is mine, of course,' said he. Afterwards he named the two Mrs. Eshton and Mrs. Dent. He looked at me. I happened to be near him, as I had been fastening the clasp of Mrs. Dent's bracelet, which had got loose. "'Will you play?' he asked. I shook my head. He did not insist, which I rather feared he would have done. He allowed me to return quietly to my usual seat. He and his aides now withdrew behind the curtain. The other party, which was headed by Colonel Dent, sat down on the crescent of chairs. One of the gentlemen, Mr. Eshton, observing me, seemed to propose that I should be asked to join them, but Lady Ingram instantly negative the notion. "'No,' I heard her say. "'She looks too stupid for any game of the sort.' Ere long a bell tinkled, and the curtain drew up. Within the arch, the bulky figure of Sir George Lynn, whom Mr. Rochester had likewise chosen, was seen enveloped in a white sheet. Before him, on a table, lay open a large book, and at his side stood Amy Eshton, draped in Mr. Rochester's cloak and holding a book in her hand. Somebody unseen rang the bell merrily. Then Adele, who had insisted on being one of her guardian's party, bounded forward, scattering round her the contents of a basket of flowers she carried on her arm. Then appeared the magnificent figure of Miss Ingram, clad in white with a long veil on her head, and a wreath of roses round her brow. By her side walked Mr. Rochester, and together they drew near the table. They knelt, while Mrs. Dent and Louisa Eshton, dressed also in white, took up their stations behind them. A ceremony followed in dumb show, in which it was easy to recognise the pantomime of a marriage. At its termination, Colonel Dent and his party consulted in whispers for two minutes. Then the Colonel called out, "'Bride!' Mr. Rochester bowed, and the curtain fell. A considerable interval elapsed before it again rose. Its second rising displayed a more elaborately prepared scene than the last. The drawing-room, as I have observed before, was raised two steps above the dining-room, and on the top of the upper step, Placed a yard or two back within the room, appeared a large marble basin, which I recognised as an ornament of the conservatory, where it usually stood, surrounded by exotics and tenanted by goldfish, and whence it must have been transported with some trouble, on account of its size and weight. Seated on the carpet, by the side of this basin, was seen Mr. Rochester, costumed in shawls with a turban on his head. His dark eyes and swarthy skin and painum features suited the costume exactly. 
he looked the very model of an eastern emir, an agent or a victim of the bowstring. Presently advanced into view Miss Ingram. She too was attired in oriental fashion, a crimson scarf tied sash-like round the waist, an embroidered handkerchief knotted about her temples, her beautifully moulded arms bare, one of them upraised in the act of supporting a pitcher, poised gracefully on her head. Both her cast of form and feature, her complexion and general air, suggested the idea of some Israelitish princess of the patriarchal days, and such was doubtless the character she intended to represent. She approached the basin, and bent over it as if to fill her pitcher. She again lifted it to her head. The personage on the well-brink now seemed to accost her, to make some request. She hasted, let down her pitcher on her hand, and gave him to drink. From the bosom of his robe he then produced a casket, opened it, and showed magnificent bracelets and earrings. She acted astonishment and admiration. Kneeling, he laid the treasure at her feet. Incredulity and delight were expressed by her looks and gestures. The stranger fastened the bracelets on her arms, and the rings in her ears. It was Eliza and Rebecca. The camels only were wanting. The divining party again laid their heads together. Apparently they could not agree about the word or syllable the scene illustrated. Colonel Dent, their spokesman, demanded the tableau of the whole, whereupon the curtain again descended. On its third rising only a portion of the drawing-room was disclosed, the rest being concealed by a screen, hung with some sort of dark and coarse drapery. The marble basin was removed. In its place stood a deal table and a kitchen chair. These objects were visible by a very dim light proceeding from a horn lantern, the wax candles being all extinguished. Amidst this sordid scene sat a man with its clenched hands resting on his knees, and his eyes bent on the ground. I knew Mr. Rochester. Though the begrimed face, the disordered dress, his coat hanging loose from one arm, as if it had been almost torn from his back in a scuffle, the desperate and scowling countenance, the rough, bristling hair might well have disguised him. As he moved, a chain clanked. To his wrists were attached fetters. "'Bridewell!' exclaimed Colonel Dent, and the charade was solved. A sufficient interval having elapsed for the performers to resume their ordinary costume, they re-entered the dining-room. Mr. Rochester led in Miss Ingram. She was complimenting him on his acting. "'Do you know,' said she, "'that of the three characters I liked you in the last best? Oh, had you but lived a few years earlier, what a gallant gentleman highwayman you would have made!' "'Is all the soot washed from my face?' he asked, turning it towards her. "'Alas, yes, more's the pity. Nothing could be more becoming to your complexion than that ruffian's rouge.' "'You would like a hero of the road, then?' "'An English hero of the road would be the next best thing to an Italian bandit, and that could only be surpassed by a Levantine pirate.' "'Well, whatever I am, remember you are my wife. We were married an hour since in the presence of all these witnesses.' She giggled, and her colour rose. "'Now, Dent,' continued Mr. Rochester, "'it is your turn.' and as the other party withdrew, he and his band took the vacated seats. Miss Ingram placed herself at her leader's right hand. The other diviners filled the chairs on each side of him and her. I did not now watch the actors. I no longer waited with interest for the curtain to rise. My attention was absorbed by the spectators. My eyes, erewhile fixed on the arch, were now irresistibly attracted to the semicircle of chairs. What charade Colonel Dent and his party played, what word they chose, how they acquitted themselves, I no longer remember. But I still see the consultation which followed each scene. I see Mr. Rochester turn to Miss Ingram, and Miss Ingram to him. I see her incline her head towards him, till the jetty curls almost touch his shoulder and wave against his cheek. I hear their mutual whisperings. I recall their interchanged glances, and something even of the feeling roused by the spectacle returns in memory at this moment. I have told you, reader, that I had learnt to love Mr. Rochester. I could not unlove him now, merely because I found that he had ceased to notice me, because I might pass hours in his presence and he would never once turn his eyes in my direction, because I saw all his attentions appropriated by a great lady, who scorned to touch me with the hem of her robes as she passed who, if even her dark and imperious eye fell on me by chance, would withdraw it instantly, as from an object too mean to merit observation. I could not unlove him, because I felt sure he would soon marry this very lady, because I read daily in her a proud security in his intentions respecting her, 
because I witnessed hourly in him a style of courtship which, if careless and choosing rather to be sought than to seek, was yet in its very carelessness captivating, and in its very pride irresistible. There was nothing to cool or banish love in these circumstances, though much to create despair. Much too you will think, reader, to engender jealousy, if a woman in my position could presume to be jealous of a woman in Miss Ingram's. But I was not jealous, or very rarely. The nature of the pain I suffered could not be explained by that word. Miss Ingram was a mark beneath jealousy. She was too inferior to excite the feeling. Pardon the seeming paradox, I mean what I say. She was very showy, but she was not genuine. She had a fine person, many brilliant attainments, but her mind was poor, her heart barren by nature. Nothing bloomed spontaneously on that soil, no unforced natural fruit delighted by its freshness. She was not good, she was not original. She used to repeat sounding phrases from books. She never offered nor had an opinion of her own. She advocated a high tone of sentiment, but she did not know the sensations of sympathy and pity. Tenderness and truth were not in her. Too often she betrayed this, by the undue vent she gave to a spiteful antipathy she had conceived against little Adèle, pushing her away with some contumelious epithet after she happened to approach her, sometimes ordering her from the room, and always treating her with coldness and acrimony. Other eyes besides mine watched these manifestations of character, watched them closely, keenly, shrewdly. Yes, the future bridegroom, Mr. Rochester himself, exercised over his intended a ceaseless surveillance, and it was from this sagacity, this guardedness of his, this perfect, clear consciousness of his fair one's defects, this obvious absence of passion in his sentiments towards her, that my ever-torturing pain arose. I saw he was going to marry her, for family, perhaps political reasons, because her rank and connections suited him. I felt he had not given her his love, and that her qualifications were ill adapted to win from him that treasure. This was the point. This was where the nerve was touched and teased. This was where the fever was sustained and fed. She could not charm him. If she had managed the victory at once, and he had yielded and sincerely laid his heart at her feet, I should have covered my face, turned to the wall, and, figuratively, have died to them. If Miss Ingram had been a good and noble woman, endowed with force, fervour, kindness, sense, I should have had one vital struggle with two tigers, jealousy and despair. Then, my heart torn out and devoured, I should have admired her, acknowledged her excellence, and been quiet for the rest of my days. And the more absolute her superiority, the deeper would have been my admiration, the more truly tranquil my quiescence. But as matters really stood, to watch Miss Ingram's efforts at fascinating Mr. Rochester, to witness their repeated failure, herself unconscious that they did fail, vainly fancying that each shaft launched hit the mark, and infatuatedly pluming herself on success, when her pride and self-complacency repelled further and further what she wished to allure, to witness this was to be at once under ceaseless excitation and ruthless restraint. Because when she failed, I saw how she might have succeeded. Arrows that continually glanced off from Mr. Rochester's breast, and fell harmless at his feet, might, I knew, if shot by a surer hand, have quivered keen in his proud heart, have called love into his stern eye, and softness into his sardonic face. Or better still, without weapons, a silent conquest might have been won. Why can she not influence him more, when she is privileged to draw so near to him? I asked myself. Surely she cannot truly like him, or not like him with true affection. If she did, she need not coin her smile so lavishly, flash her glances so unremittingly, manufacture airs so elaborate, graces so multitudinous. It seems to me that she might, by merely sitting quietly at his side, saying little and looking less, get nigher his heart. I have seen in his face a far different expression from that which hardens it now, while she is so vivaciously accosting him. But then it came of itself. It was not elicited by meretricious arts and calculated manoeuvres, and one had but to accept it, to answer what he asked without pretension, to address him when needful without grimace. And it increased, and grew kinder and more genial, and warmed one like a fostering sunbeam. How will she manage to please him when they are married? I do not think she will manage it. And yet it might be managed. 
and his wife might, I verily believe, be the very happiest woman the sun shines on. I have not yet said anything condemnatory of Mr. Rochester's project of marrying for interest and connections. It surprised me when I first discovered that such was his intention. I had thought him a man unlikely to be influenced by motives so commonplace in his choice of a wife. But the longer I considered the position, education, etc., of the parties, the less I felt justified in judging and blaming either him or Miss Ingram for acting in conformity to ideas and principles instilled into them, doubtless, from their childhood. All their class held these principles. I supposed, then, they had reasons for holding them such as I could not fathom. It seemed to me that, were I a gentleman like him, I would take to my bosom only such a wife as I could love. But the very obviousness of the advantages to the husband's own happiness offered by this plan, convinced me that there must be arguments against its general adoption, of which I was quite ignorant. Otherwise, I felt sure all the world would act as I wished to act. But in other points, as well as this, I was growing very lenient to my master. I was forgetting all his faults, for which I had once kept a sharp look-out. It had formerly been my endeavour to study all sides of his character, to take the bad with the good, and from the just weighing of both to form an equitable judgment. Now I saw no bad. The sarcasm that had repelled, the harshness that had startled me once, were only like keen condiments in a choice dish. Their presence was pungent, but their absence would be felt as comparatively insipid. And as for the vague something, was it a sinister or a sorrowful, a designing or a desponding expression, that opened upon a careful observer now and then in his eye, and closed again before one could fathom the strange depth partially disclosed, that something which used to make me fear and shrink, as if I had been wandering amongst volcanic-looking hills, and had suddenly felt the ground quiver and seen it gape, that something I at intervals beheld still, and with throbbing heart, but not with palsy nerves. Instead of wishing to shun him, I longed only to dare, to divine it. And I thought Miss Ingram happy, because one day she might look into the abyss at her leisure, explore its secrets, and analyse their nature. Meantime, while I thought only of my master and his future bride, saw only them, heard only their discourse, and considered only their movements of importance, the rest of the party were occupied with their own separate interests and pleasures. The ladies Lynn and Ingram continued to consort in solemn conferences, where they nodded their two turbans at each other, and held up their four hands in confronting gestures of surprise, or mystery or horror, according to the theme on which their gossip ran, like a pair of magnified puppets. Mild Mrs. Dent talked with good-natured Mrs. Eshton, and the two sometimes bestowed a courteous word or smile on me. Sir George Lynn, Colonel Dent, and Mr. Eshton discussed politics, or county affairs, or justice business. Lord Ingram flirted with Amy Eshton, Louisa played and sang to and with one of the Messrs. Lynn, and Mary Ingram listened languidly to the gallant speeches of the other. Sometimes all, as with one consent, suspended their by-play to observe and listen to the principal actors, for after all Mr. Rochester, and, because closely connected with him, Miss Ingram, were the life and soul of the party. If he was absent from the room an hour, a perceptible dullness seemed to steal over the spirits of his guests, and his re-entrance was sure to give a fresh impulse to the vivacity of conversation. The want of his animating influence appeared to be peculiarly felt one day that he had been summoned to milk it on business, and was not likely to return till late. The afternoon was wet. A walk the party had proposed to take to see a gypsy camp, lately pitched on a common beyond hay, was consequently deferred. Some of the gentlemen were gone to the stables. The younger ones, together with the younger ladies, were playing billiards in the billiard-room. The dowagers Ingram and Lynn sought solace in a quiet game at cards. Blanche Ingram, after having repelled, by supercilious taciturnity, some efforts of Mrs. Dent and Mrs. Eshton to draw her into conversation, had first murmured over some sentimental tunes and airs on the piano, and then, having fetched a novel from the library, had flung herself in haughty listlessness on a sofa, and prepared to beguile, by the spell of fiction, the tedious hours of absence. The room and the house were silent. Only now and then the merriment of the billiard-players was heard from above. It was verging on dusk, and the clock had already given warning of the hour to dress for dinner, when little Adèle, who knelt by me in the drawing-room window-seat, suddenly exclaimed, "'Voilà, Monsieur Rochester, qui revient!' I turned, and Miss Ingram darted forwards from her sofa. The others, too, looked up from their several occupations. 
for at the same time a crunching of wheels and a splashing tramp of horse-hoofs became audible on the wet gravel. A post-chaise was approaching. "'What can possess him to come home in that style?' said Miss Ingram. "'He rode Mesraw, the black horse, did he not, when he went out? And Pilate was with him? What has he done with the animals?' As she said this, she approached a tall person and ample garments so near the window, that I was obliged to bend back almost to the breaking of my spine. In her eagerness she did not observe me at first, but when she did, she curled her lip and moved to another casement. The post-chaise stopped, the driver rang the door-bell, and a gentleman alighted attired in travelling garb, but it was not Mr. Rochester. It was a tall, fashionable-looking man, a stranger. "'How provoking!' exclaimed Miss Ingram. "'You tiresome monkey!' apostrophizing Adele, "'who perched you up in the window to give false intelligence!' And she cast on me an angry glance, as if I were in fault. Some parleying was audible in the hall, and soon the newcomer entered. He bowed to Lady Ingram, as deeming her the eldest lady present. "'It appears I come at an inopportune time, madam,' said he, "'when my friend, Mr. Rochester, is from home. But I arrive from a very long journey and I think I may presume so far on old and intimate acquaintance as to install myself here till he returns." His manner was polite. His accent, in speaking, struck me as being somewhat unusual, not precisely foreign, but still not altogether English. His age might be about Mr. Rochester's, between thirty and forty. His complexion was singularly sallow. Otherwise he was a fine-looking man, at first sight especially. On closer examination, you detected something in his face that displeased, or rather that failed to please. His features were regular, but too relaxed. His eye was large and well cut, but the life looking out of it was a tame, vacant life. At least so I thought. The sound of the dressing-bell dispersed the party. It was not till after dinner that I saw him again. He seemed then quite at his ease. But I liked his physiognomy even less than before. It struck me as being at the same time unsettled and inanimate. His eye wandered, and had no meaning in its wandering. This gave him an odd look, such as I never remembered to have seen. For a handsome and not unamiable-looking man, he repelled me exceedingly. There was no power in that smooth-skinned face of a full oval shape, no firmness in that aquiline nose and small cherry mouth, there was no thought on the low, even forehead, no command in that blank brown eye. As I sat in my usual nook, and looked at him with the light of the girandole on the mantelpiece beaming full over him, for he occupied an armchair drawn close to the fire, and kept shrinking still nearer, as if he were cold, I compared him with Mr. Rochester. I think, with deference be it spoken, the contrast could not be much greater between a sleek gander and a fierce falcon, between a meek sheep and the rough-coated, keen-eyed dog, its guardian. He had spoken of Mr. Rochester as an old friend. A curious friendship theirs must have been, a pointed illustration indeed of the old adage that extremes meet. Two or three of the gentlemen sat near him, and I caught at times scraps of their conversation across the room. At first I could not make much sense of what I had heard, for the discourse of Louisa Eshton and Mary Ingram, who sat nearer to me, confused the fragmentary sentences that reached me at intervals. These last were discussing the stranger. They both called him a beautiful man. Louisa said he was, a love of a creature, and she adored him. And Mary instanced his pretty little mouth and nice nose, as her ideal of the charming. "'And what a sweet-tempered forehead he has!' cried Louisa. "'So smooth! None of those frowning irregularities I dislike so much! And such a placid eye and smile!' And then, to my great relief, Mr. Henry Lynn summoned them to the other side of the room, to settle some point about the deferred excursion to Hay Common. I was now able to concentrate my attention on the group by the fire, and I presently gathered that the newcomer was called Mr. Mason. Then I learned that he was but just arrived in England, and that he came from some hot country, which was the reason, doubtless, his face was so sallow, and that he sat so near the hearth, and wore a surtout in the house. Presently the words, Jamaica, Kingston, Spanish Town, indicated the West Indies as his residence, and it was with no little surprise I gathered, ere long, that he had there first seen and become acquainted with Mr. Rochester. He spoke of his friend's dislike of the burning heats, the hurricanes, and rainy seasons of that region. I knew Mr. Rochester had been a traveller, Mrs. Fairfax had said so, but I thought the continent of Europe had bounded his wanderings, till now I had never heard a hint given of visits to more distant shores. 
I was pondering these things when an incident, and a somewhat unexpected one, broke the thread of my musings. Mr. Mason, shivering as some one chanced to open the door, asked for more coal to be put on the fire which had burnt out its flame, though its mass of cinder still shone quite hot and red. The footman, who brought the coal and going out, stopped near Mr. Reston's chair, and said something to him in a low voice, of which I heard only the words, "'Old woman, quite troublesome.' "'Tell her she shall be put in the stocks if she does not take herself off,' replied the magistrate. "'No, stop,' interrupted Colonel Dent. "'Don't send her away, Eshton. We might turn the thing to account. Better consult the ladies.' And speaking aloud, he continued, "'Ladies, you talked of going to Hay Common to visit the gypsy camp. Sam here says that one of the old mother bunches is in the servants' hall at this moment, and insists upon being brought in before the quality to tell them their fortunes. Would you like to see her?' "'Surely, Colonel,' cried Lady Ingram, "'you would not encourage such a low impostor. Dismiss her by all means at once.' "'But I cannot persuade her to go away, my lady,' said the footman. "'Nor can any of the servants. Mrs. Fairfax is with her just now, entreating her to be gone. But she has taken a chair in the chimney-corner, and says nothing shall stir her from it till she gets leave to come in here.' "'What does she want?' asked Mrs. Eshton. "'To tell the gentry their fortune,' she says, ma'am, and she swears she must and will do it." "'What is she like?' inquired the Mrs. Eshton, in a breath. A shockingly ugly old creature, miss, almost as black as a crock. "'Why, she's a real sorceress!' cried Frederick Glynn. "'Let us have her in, of course.' "'To be sure,' rejoined his brother. "'It would be a thousand pities to throw away such a chance of fun.' "'My dear boys, what are you thinking about?' exclaimed Mrs. Lynn. "'I cannot possibly countenance any such inconsistent proceeding,' chimed in the dowager Ingram. "'Indeed, mamma. But you can, and will,' pronounced the haughty voice of Blanche, as she turned round on the piano-stool, where till now she had sat silent, apparently examining sundry sheets of music. "'I have a curiosity to hear my fortune told. Therefore, Sam, order the bell-dam forward.' "'My darling Blanche, recollect!' "'I do. I recollect all you can suggest, and I must have my will. Quick, Sam!' "'Yes, yes, yes!' cried all the juveniles, both ladies and gentlemen. "'Let her come. It will be excellent sport.' The footman still lingered. "'She looks such a rough one,' said he. "'Go!' ejaculated Miss Ingram, and the man went. Excitement instantly seized the whole party. A running fire of raillery and jest was proceeding when Sam returned. "'She won't come now,' said he. "'She says it's not her mission to appear before the vulgar herd. Them's her words. I must show her into a room by herself, and then those who wish to consult her must go to her one by one." "'You see now, my queenly Blanche,' began Lady Ingram, "'she encroaches. Be advised, my angel girl, and—' "'Show her into the library, of course,' cut in the angel girl. "'It is not my mission to listen to her before the vulgar herd, either. I mean to have her all to myself. Is there a fire in the library?' "'Yes, ma'am. But she looks such a tinkler. Cease that chatter, blockhead, and do my bidding." Again Sam vanished, and mystery, animation, expectation rose to full flow once more. "'She's ready now,' said the footman, as he reappeared. "'She wishes to know who will be her first visitor.' "'I think I had better just look in upon her before any of the ladies go,' said Colonel Dent. "'Tell her, Sam, a gentleman is coming.' Sam went and returned. She says, sir, that she'll have no gentlemen, they need not trouble themselves to come near her, nor, he added, with difficulty expressing a titter, any ladies either, except the young and single. "'By Jove, she has taste!' exclaimed Henry Lynn. Miss Ingram rose solemnly. "'I go first, she said, in a tone which might have befitted the leader of a forlorn hope, mounting a breach in the van of his men. "'Oh, my best! Oh, my dearest! Pause! Reflect!' was her mamma's cry. But she swept past her in stately silence, passed through the door which Colonel Dent held open, and we heard her enter the library. A comparative silence ensued. Lady Ingram thought it le cas to wring her hands, which she did accordingly. Miss Mary declared she felt for her part she never dared venture. Amy and Louisa Eshton tittered under their breath, and looked a little frightened. The minutes passed very slowly. Fifteen were counted before the library door again opened. Miss Ingram returned to us through the arch. Would she laugh? 
Would she take it as a joke? All eyes met her with a glance of eager curiosity, and she met all eyes with one of coldness and rebuff. She looked neither flurried nor merry. She walked stiffly to her seat and took it in silence. "'Well, Blanche,' said Lord Ingram. "'What did she say, sister?' asked Mary. "'What did you think? How do you feel? Is she a real fortune-teller?' demanded the Mrs. Eshton. "'Now, now, good people,' returned Miss Ingram, "'don't press upon me. Really, your organs of wonder and credulity are easily excited. You seem, by the importance of you all, my good mamma included, ascribed to this matter, absolutely to believe we have a genuine witch in the house, who is in close alliance with the old gentleman. I have seen a gipsy vagabond. She has practised in hackneyed fashion the science of palmistry, and told me what such people usually tell. My whim is gratified, and now I think Mr. Eshton would do well to put the hag in the stocks to-morrow morning, as he threatened." Miss Ingram took a book leant back in her chair, and so declined further conversation. I watched her for nearly half an hour. During all that time she never turned a page, and her face grew momently darker, more dissatisfied, and more sourly expressive of disappointment. She had obviously not heard anything to her advantage, and it seemed to me, from her prolonged fits of gloom and taciturnity, that she herself, notwithstanding her professed indifference, attached undue importance to whatever revelations had been made her. Meantime, Mary Ingram, Amy and Louisa Eshton, declared they dared not go alone, and yet they all wished to go. A negotiation was opened through the medium of the ambassador, Sam, and after much pacing to and fro, till, I think, the said Sam's calves must have ached with the exercise, permission was at last, with great difficulty, extorted from the rigorous Sybil for the three to wait upon her in a body. Their visit was not so still as Miss Ingram's had been. We heard hysterical giggling and little shrieks proceeding from the library, and at the end of about twenty minutes they burst the door open, and came running across the hall as if they were half scared out of their wits. "'I am sure she is something not right!' they cried, one and all. "'She told us such things! She knows all about us!' And they sank breathless into the various seats the gentlemen hastened to bring them. Pressed for further explanation, they declared she had told them of things they had said and done when they were mere children, described books and ornaments they had in their boudoirs at home, keepsakes that different relations had presented to them. They affirmed that she had even divined their thoughts, and had whispered in the ear of each the name of the person she liked best in the world, and informed them of what they most wished for. Here the gentlemen interposed with earnest petitions to be further enlightened on these two last-named points but they got only blushes, ejaculations, tremors, and titters, in return for their importunity. The matrons, meantime, offered vinaigrettes and wielded fans, and again and again reiterated the expression of their concern that their warning had not been taken in time, and the elder gentlemen laughed, and the younger urged their services on the agitated fair ones. In the midst of the tumult, and while my eyes and ears were fully engaged in the scene before me, I heard a hem close at my elbow. I turned, and saw Sam. If you please, miss, the gypsy declares that there is another young single lady in the room who has not been to her yet, and she swears she will not go till she has seen all. I thought it must be you. There is no one else for it. What shall I tell her?" "'Oh, I will go by all means,' I answered, and I was glad of the unexpected opportunity to gratify my much-excited curiosity. I slipped out of the room, unobserved by any eye, for the company were gathered in one mass about the trembling trio just returned, and I closed the door quietly behind me. "'If you like, miss,' said Sam, "'I'll wait in the hall for you, and if she frightens you, just call and I'll come in.' "'No, Sam, return to the kitchen. I am not in the least afraid.' Nor was I, but I was a good deal interested and excited. End of chapter 18